Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got a record number of people uh, joining us, so we, we're really hoping that technology is our friend this morning. My name is Jill Halford, and I head up the national uh, charities team at BDO. We all hope that you're keeping safe and well in what continues to be a really challenging time for us. As many of you will know, this is our, our fifth charity webinar in the series. Um, and this one is our charity finance update. So we developed this series of webinars um, starting in March um, of last year to really assist our charity clients through, uh, through the difficult time of COVID. Um, don't worry if you couldn't attend the previous ones, but if you are keen to watch them, they've all been recorded and they're all available on our website on our charity pages. So please do let us know if you'd like to receive a, a recording of those and, and have a catch up. So first, I just wanted to kick off with some housekeeping. Um, today's session is recorded and will circulate the recording and the slides um, early next week. We have got almost 400 people um, uh, registered for the session. Um, I can see from the numbers are, are slowly clicking up there. We've got over 250 people online at the moment. Um, so if you could make sure um, that the, uh, you are on mute when the speakers are talking, that would be really super because it would really help with the, with the sound quality for everyone. Now, if you do have any questions uh, for the speakers as we're going through the sessions, you'll see towards the bottom of the screen, I'm sure people are familiar with Zoom now, um, the Q&A function. So please post your questions uh, using the Q&A function. And if you can address those to all panelists, we'll mon monitor those as we're going through. If you do have any issues with sound or any technical issues, again, uh, we've got Hannah and Beth helping us uh, resolve those. And please do post those in the chat function next to the Q&A. Um, I would say we, we are kicking off the session uh, with uh, Glyn, my colleague from um, our VAT team. team. Um, Glyn's in demand at the moment, so he will be uh, leaving us, unfortunately, after his session. So if you do have any uh, VAT questions, then get those in early, and we will ask a few of those before uh, Glyn leaves us. So what will we cover today? We're going to click kick off, obviously, with Glyn. I've just mentioned that. Um, and we'll then be followed by um, Liz from our technical standards group, who's going to take us through an accounting and audit update. Uh, Fiona Condren, one of my um, dear colleagues who I know will, will be familiar to a lot of you, uh, will take us through best practice reporting um, and cover some of those key changes that we're seeing coming through. Fiona will be followed by Matthew from our business uh, restructuring team, who's going to talk about going concern. And then we'll hand over with the last session um, of today, with Caroline and Katie taking us through national minimum wage. Now we do have a lot to get through in an hour and a half. Um, so if we don't go into the detail um, that you would like, then please do let us know. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to Glyn to take us through his VAT update. Thanks Glyn. Thank you, thank you Jill. Um, and a very warm welcome to everybody this morning. Um, it's a very, very busy time uh, in VAT at the moment. So if we uh, if, if, if we move on to my first slide, um, you'll see that we're going to try and cover quite a lot of ground um, in quite a short period of time. Um, so if I if I do go on a little bit too quickly, as, as Jill said, do let us know and we can do a more detailed session as we go forward. So I'm going to have a quick chat about the government support package and some changes that were announced last week. Um, there's a little issue with Brexit, which has happened. Um, which you, you might have seen in the news. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other VAT changes, which are also on the on the calendar, and I'm going to uh, dive into into one case because I think it's it's particularly interesting and has some um, some other issues appended to it. So if I if I start with um, my first slide on the the the, the COVID support. Um, you will remember um, that the government allowed businesses to postpone their VAT um, liabilities uh, between the period March and June. Um, originally, that was due to be paid back by the end of March uh, this year. Um, 
But they then announced that if, if you qualify, you can opt to pay back that amount in equal instalments um, right the way over to March 2022, giving a massive cash flow boost for, for many, many struggling, uh, many, many struggling entities, particularly uh, in the charitable sector. So um, how do you do that? Well, for the far, for a start, you, you, you have to have a deferred VAT still to pay. So if you've paid it, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get it back and then defer it. Um, you must have all your VAT returns in, in, in an up-to-date, um, otherwise they'll say that, that you're not compliant and they're not going to do it. And most importantly, and if you take nothing else away from my session, um, you need to opt in before the end of March. Um, the opt-in process hasn't been released yet, <laughs> helpfully, um, and given uh, the government's uh, stresses and strains through Brexit and everything else at the minute, it's likely to be quite late. But please do keep an eye on that. Don't rely on, on, on anybody telling you about it. Keep an eye on the, on the government website um, just to make sure that you, you, you do opt in. Um, and of course, you need to make your first uh, instalment on time. Last week, the government did announce that if you want to include other adjustments, such as uh, errors or VAT assessments, um, you can, um, but you need to tell the COVID support team before the 29th of January um, 2021. Yes, that's this week. Um, and the assessment has to have been processed and the statement already issued. So if it hasn't been, then I'm, I'm guessing that's not gonna be a, a possibility for you. Um, if you have, you've only got two days. Um, as I say, apology for the lack of information, the lack of uh, timing on that, but that was only only released last week. So if we move on to uh, the world's biggest topic, Brexit, um, I can't, in all honesty, do, um, do 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 a lot of justice to to, to the subject. But if you um, Google BDO Brexit Hub. Um, we have a Brexit hub. On there, there are three on-demand webinars which go through the detailed VAT and customs duty changes. Um, you'll hear me droning on again because unfortunately I did, even though I'm headed not for profit, did end up um, dealing with that as well. So you'll be aware that the UK left uh, the European Union with effect from the 31st of December last year at 11 p.m. Obviously because the uh, because because we left on on European time. Um, but there was uh, a thing called the Trade Cooperation Agreement, or TCA, um, agreed and approved. Uh, now, that was announced on, on Christmas Eve, on 24th of December. Um, and obviously, that's a, that's a little bit of theatre there from both the European Union and, and from the UK government. It deals with a number of practical issues. Um, but for me, the, the, the key point here is it, it's effectively a free trade agreement that gives zero tariffs on UK to EU trade. And, and that obviously applies to us um, because you know many charities do move goods across borders across that. Um, it's worth remembering though that uh, it doesn't put us back to the status quo. Um, there aren't any intra-EU movements anymore. They're going to be formal imports and exports. And that means that you need import declarations and you need export declarations. So when you move goods from the UK into the European Union, you're going to need a, a, an export declaration to be completed on this end and an import declaration to whoever is going to import them at the other end. And those, those issues as to who, who does that um, will have a major impact on, on the future VAT um, liability for you and, and your customer. So it's really important to get your head around that if you're involved in that kind of thing. Um, the other thing I would say is even if you don't do a lot of European trade, actually it's worth making sure you have an EORI number because I've yet to see a charity that hasn't ever imported anything. Um, so I would apply for an EORI number. It only takes about 24 hours and it will just be your, your VAT number and, and, and four digits, but it does enable you to, to be an importer into the UK. So if you, you have little bits and pieces of goods, you can, move, you can use that. Um, there is a, there has been an introduction of, of, of um, postponed VAT accounting, which means that your import VAT can now be accounted for on the VAT return itself. Um, and that's, that's really, really helpful, except for the fact that the government in their public notice have said it only applies to business um, supplies. And that obviously leaves a question if I'm moving goods for my non-business activities of my charity, whether I can actually use a, 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 the, um, the postponed VAT accounting or whether I need to pay um, the, the import VAT because it's, it's for non-business purpose. Um, we have asked uh, revenue policy about that. And frankly, they don't know.
Um, so we're still waiting for that to be confirmed. Um, I think in the meantime, given the fact we're now a month in, I would assume that the PVA does apply to us because we are still we are still in business, even if we are even if we're not entirely in business. So let, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so the trade and the, the TCA itself, what does it do? So what the TCA does, it removes customs duty um, on any products that have UK or EU origin. And this is really important to, to, to remember, basically because it's not all goods moving between the UK and the EU. Um, it's only those which have that origin status. So goods that have come in from overseas uh, are then sent on to the EU do not have UK origin and you can potentially have customs duty still to pay even though it's between two signatories to the TCA. Goods which are wholly made in the UK obviously will be UK origin and will have no customs duty on them and goods manufactured partly using overseas components um, might not be under the TCA or they might be under the TCA depending on the balance. There's quite a complicated calculation actually carried out um, and it varies slightly for different types of goods. So if you're involved in that, probably worth talking to somebody um, to help guide you through that. Um, one little issue that I'm going to mention, um, which I don't really have the answer to at the minute, um, it appears to be a problem of goods coming from the EU and going back into the EU in that they seem to lose their EU origin when they come in and get and get sent back out again. So um, this was the, 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 the issue that you would have seen in the newspapers with Percy Pigs. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a particular problem, particularly if you've got goods coming in from the continent and then getting shipped onto Ireland. So um, yeah, depends on what work you do on those goods. If you do a sufficient work, obviously it doesn't matter that they're not EU origin, it could be UK origin, um, but it's worth, worth looking at and worth, because there are other customs release that will remove that. So moving, quickly on to the other changes that we've got incoming. Um, the first of these, if we move on to the first slide, thank you, um, is making tax digital. Now, obviously we've talked about this for a long, long time and I think I've got a question on that, so I'll, I'll see if I can cover it. Um, the first phase uh, of MTD, very successfully rolled out. Just about everybody I know is successfully finding VAT returns via API. Um, all that's working very, very well. The second phase um, was, uh, was delayed due to COVID, um, but is now required or for all refat returns uh, starting after uh, the 1st of April 2021. Um, the soft landing period, uh, as, as it's been uh, announced by the revenue, uh, will certainly end um, with effect from April. And that means that from that date, you can have no, um, you need an unbroken digital chain of information from the entry into your accounting system right the way through to the VAT return. You can't have any manual intervention and you can't have cut and paste. Um, that is going to be very, very difficult for a number of charities. And certainly I'm working with a number of my clients to try and help them get to that point. Um, the difficulties, of course, being that you know, charities are complicated. Their VAT returns are complicated. Often you have business, non-business, and you also have partial exemption to do, which, which often happen outside of the, the accounting system. Um, you can apply for an extension to the deadline. Um, but our experience of applying for that deadline um, is, is, is that uh, you need a really, really good reason and you need really, really good documentation. So uh, process maps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have got a question on MTD, so I'll see if I can cover that as I go along. Um, okay, so um, when will this happen? Well, all that returns starting with the 1st of April, 2021. Um, Will HMRC have, have full access to systems? No, they won't be able to do that. Um, they promised that even though it is a two-way API link, so technically they can, if they really want to, look through the API link, they've confirmed that they're not intending to do that and they're not intending to do any remote um, manipulation of your data. Um, so, so that shouldn't happen. Okay, so moving on to the other big change that's coming coming down the line, and that is the domestic reverse charge on, on construction services. Now, this has already been delayed once um, to, to March this year um, and may be delayed again. Um, what does it do? Well, it means that along a chain of, of construction industry uh, supply, so anything qualifying, qualifying for CIS, basically, um, that VAT isn't charged on those supplies. Instead, it's accounted for by the recipient of the supply by charging themselves VAT and then moving it down the chain. Um, 
right the way through to the end user um, who is uh, able to issue a certificate and then be charged VAT in the normal way. Now, there is a big debate in VAT at the minute as to exactly what that means um, and what happens to you if you don't issue a certificate. Um, obviously, if you don't issue a certificate, for most charities, that will be a big um, cash flow boost because it means you don't have to pay VAT and then seek to claim it or part of it back. Um, it goes straight on the VAT return and gets dealt with in the normal way. Um, revenue seem to be ambivalent as to whether you issue one or not, uh, which is really, really surprising. Um, uh, to the point where many, many commentators are suggesting that it's actually an optional um, thing to, to, to raise a certificate. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that's uh, I, I think that's a pushing it a little bit far. Um, but if you decide not to issue, there's nothing that's going to happen to you by the looks of it. Specific issues with charities, obviously, um, it's useful uh, in, in a way because it enables you to control your VAT liabilities rather than trying to persuade a, a builder to, to, to understand that the complexities of, of charity buildings. Um, has a means that the the onus is on you mind you uh, rather than them uh, design and build companies are connected to an end user so may have to issue a, a certificate if you're going to go down that route um, and the key point here is it is disastrous for for the chain's cash flow so if you go down to the bottom end of a, a construction industry chain they use vat for working capital now that's going to be removed um, there's a good chance that a lot of businesses are going to go out of business so have to keep an eye on that as we go forward so if we move on to um, my very last one, because uh, I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, people often ask me whether revenue give charities an easy time um, for, for VAT. Um, and I, I tend to answer it by pointing out um, something like the Help the Aged case where the revenue um, decided to challenge it, you know, uh, care for old people would, shouldn't be shouldn't be exempt from VAT just to demonstrate that actually no they don't give it. Um, this is on the other side of it and possibly gives um, some idea as to why. Um, this is a case involving um, Colchester Institute. It was a it was a FE college, um, further education college. Um, there was a little vogue for a little while in VAT um, using a principle called Lenarts. And basically what it said was if you had non-business use of a building or partial non-business use of a building, it was OK to claim all of the VAT and then charge yourself for the um, non-business use as you go forward, um, rather than just claiming back the non-business percentage to start with, the, the, the percentage which relate to business in the, in the first place. Um, it was all a bit, always a bit crazy, but the revenue accepted it. Um, and then we had a court case which basically said you weren't able to do it anymore um, and it, it, it was never right and, and should be packed away. The government in a, in, in a, in a fit of generosity um, enabled people who um, were in such arrangements to continue to use those arrangements till they, till, till they concluded or you could unravel it if you wished. Unfortunately, um, a class action was put together by, by a boutique firm um, trying to claim back the output tax that they, they, they said was overpaid, um, with the input tax that, that related to that being now out of time and therefore not subject to adjustment. Um, it seemed a bit uh, a bit cheeky, uh, if I'm absolutely honest. Uh, and I, I was kind of surprised that, that, that further education colleges went for that. Um, but um, the, the, the courts basically have looked at it. They, they, they've thrown it out saying, but actually the Birmingham Hippodrome case allows the revenue to, to offset the output tax and the out of time input tax anyway. So in most cases, it's not gonna be much of an advantage. Um, but what it did find, and, and this is a bit that worries me a little bit, it did find that um, the review of the, of, of the grants effectively um, for, for student education, it's effectively said that those are business activities on the payments for, for business activity. And that means that um, FE College's core business is a business. Now, the outcome of that is that um, obviously uh, relevant charitable purpose buildings, you need to be wholly non-business. So that, that goes away. And the lower rate for fuel and power also goes away. So although it looks like we got to a morally correct position, what we have got is, is, is an uncertain position as regards those types of grants. If you've got those kind of, kind of grants, well worth having a look at and see how that's going to impact on you. Um, the government's not said it's going to apply it in that way. 
um, but it may feel that it has no choice. So I think that brings the, the VAT piece to an end. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hand on, I think. So I've been asked today to talk through um, some of the accounting and auditing updates that are going to have the impact on um, our audits and accounts preparations this year. Um, I think you may be wondering why I'm going to talk to you about auditing updates, because I know the audience here today aren't auditors, but um, it will have, um, we've had a couple of key changes to um, two of the auditing standards around accounting estimates and going concern, and they will have an impact on the audit, both in terms of the information that we need our clients to provide to us and the timing of that information. Okay, next slide, please. But first of all, I just want to run through the accounting update. Um, luckily, um, it's a very slow year in terms of updates. Um, there have been some uh, very few and limited updates to UK GAAP. Uh, the first one I'm highlighting here is around COVID-19 related rent concessions, and I will talk through some examples of that in a moment. But there are two others that I've got on the screen here that I just want to make you aware of. I'm not going to run through them in any detail because they are quite specific. One is around interest rate benchmark reform, and a second one is a very um, specific requirement, which is when you have a defined benefit pension scheme and you have the information to bring that onto your balance sheet for the first time. So if you are in any of those situations, just want to make you aware that there are some specific changes there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the thing I want to go through in detail here is a very, very specific amendment uh, that's been brought about as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they wanted to bring this to your attention because we're aware that lots of lots of charities will um, have investment properties, so there'll be there'll be lessors and lots of I know our clients have worked from multiple locations, so they're also lessees. Now this is a very spe specific amendment where you've been able to negotiate a reduction in rent as a direct result of the pandemic. So if we just run through the slide here and um, some of the, the key technical parts. So its amendment applies to periods beginning the 1st of January 2020 onwards, but earlier application is permitted. Now, there are very, um, very specific requirements. If you do meet the requirements, then you must apply the change. So it's for temporary rent concessions. So that's um, in situations where your lease payments have been revised and they're lower than they were previously before the change. Any reduction in those lease payments affects only payments that were originally due on or before the 30th of June 2021. And then uh, the third requirement is there's no other significant changes to the terms and conditions of the lease. Now, um, if you have a rent deferral, so, for example, you, you have rent for a three month period in 2020, not then due until 2021, then um, this change wouldn't apply. It's purely for if there is a reduction. And if we move on to the next slide, um, I just want to run through an example here in respect, in respect of a lessee and how they'd account for it. So for a lessee, you'd recognise any change in lease payments arising from this um, when you meet the con conditions over the period that the change was intended to compensate. So that means that if you got a rent holiday for the period, say, of March 2020 to June 2020, so that rent has been waived, so no rent is due, then you wouldn't recognise a lease expense in that period. What you would also need to do then is think about the disclosure of that in your financial statements. Um, in respect of a lessor, the, the, the kind of reverse um, it applies. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, if you offer a rent holiday, a rent waiver to one of your tenants, then you wouldn't show that income in the corresponding period. Just using that same example there, say March 2020 to June 2020, you'd have no income recorded in your, in your sofa in respect of that or in your income expenditure account in respect of that. OK, so it's quite a specific change and uh, just wanted to draw that to your attention. Um, if we move on to the next slide, in terms of charity SORP updates, again, it's been a very quiet year. Um, there have been no actual changes to the SORP this year, uh, but what they have, uh, what has been released are a couple more information sheets. So um, the first one, information sheet five, that's in regard to um, charitable companies and the ones that have to include their energy and carbon reporting. I know Fiona is going to talk in, in more detail about that later. 
And then um, a second sheet has been um, has been released, information sheet six. This is very specific. I won't go into any detail, but this is for Irish charities. So if we have any anybody who who um, works with Irish charities on the call, it's around merger accounting and um, the Republic of Ireland company law. So a very, very specific, specific point there. OK, so if we move on to um, our audit update. So the things I want to talk through with you today is there have been two revisions to um, two very key revisions to accounting standards, one around accounting estimates, the other one around going concern. And then I also want to highlight um, some changes to our audit reports. So you will find that this year our reports look a bit different and are probably going to be a little bit longer. So if we move on to um, ISA 540 and accounting estimates. Um, here we go. Uh, so yes, as I say, it's a revised auditing standard. Now this is effective for periods beginning on or after the 15th of December 2019. So really it's going to affect our uh, 31st of December 2020 year ends onwards. Um, there are some additional requirements that have been put on auditors when we're looking at our audit of accounting estimates. Um, the key things, I've just highlighted a few on the on the screen here, is that we really need to do more work identifying accounting estimates at the risk assessment stage. We need to get a really robust understanding of management's processes and controls around making those estimates. We need to think about the underlying data, the methods, the assumptions used in making the the estimate. We have a requirement too to perform a retrospective review of estimates. So re-looking at the estimates that management made in the prior period and looking at how they actually turned out. Uh, there's a lot of focus on professional skepticism and how, where we need to really challenge um, management. This is particularly important in areas where we're looking at fair values, where we're looking at impairments, when we're looking at provisions. Uh, we have to look at the disclosures around accounting estimates, make sure they're complete, make sure they're comprehensive, make sure they're accurate. And then we also have this requirement to stand back and assess whether there's been any potential management bias in terms of the estimates overall. So how does this affect you um, as our clients? So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, the impact this year is that we'll probably need a bit more time from management uh, when we're doing our work on accounting estimates, particularly during the audit planning. Uh, there is the requirement on us in the standard to really robustly look at some of these, um, uh, these estimates as part of our risk assessment procedures. Um, we'll need management to really clearly identify their own material accounting estimates. So it's not for us to come along and identify them. We, we at the starting point is the information provided to us. Um, we'll require management to explain the processes, the systems and controls in how they form the accounting estimates. Um, if um, the risk, if we then assess that the risk is higher regarding material misstatement of that estimate, then there would be more work effort and would perhaps need more information later on in the audit from management. Um, what you might be asked for this time that you may not have been asked for in as much detail before is for you to prepare a paper to really explain those estimates, document any key judgments and decisions that have been made informing the estimate. Um, we have to, um, we have to be quite challenging in how that estimate has been formed. So I would expect you to feel to have um, a lot more questions coming from your audit team. Um, if you have any third parties involved in helping you make those assessments, then you might see us this year contact, trying to contact those um, experts direct, which we may not have done in previous years. And then finally, um, we do generally, if there are any key estimates and judgments and financial statements, we'll tend to have um, paragraphs in our management representation letter. So this year, that might look a little bit different in terms of the wording. OK, um, the next um, audit update I want to go through is um, quite a key one is going concern. Anyone who's been through an audit in the last 12 months will know that a lot of time as a result of the pandemic has been has been spent on the audit of going concern. Um, I know we've had lots of feedback from our from our clients about that, and um, partly from our, our our point of view is that we've asked more questions because we have early adopted the principles of this new standard. Now, going forwards, again for the same same effective periods, our thirty first of December twenty twenty year ends onwards, we now have to apply the standard in full. Um, so why has this standard changed? 
Um, it's really in a direct response to some of the large corporate failures like Carillion and Thomas Cook. There, you will have seen in the press a lot of criticism of auditors through those failures and um, lots of questions asking about why auditors fail to highlight concerns about going concern. So the standard really, it, it, it requires us to have greater work to robustly challenge management's assessment of going concern, to look at the supporting e estimates, to really consider whether there's any um, risk of management bias. Uh, there's improved transparency in terms of the reporting requirements. And then we have a, a final stand back requirement to consider all of the evidence that we've got throughout our whole audit whether it corroborates management's view, whether it contradicts it, and then to draw our own conclusion on going concern. Now, if we move to the next slide, um, I've put a, um, a, a, just a, a definition here, just in explaining the auditor's responsibilities in terms of going concern. So we need to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence um, regarding and to conclude on the appropriateness of management's use of the going concern basis of accounting in the financial statements. And we need to conclude based on the audit evidence that we've obtained, whether a material uncertainty exists. So previously, if you've seen our audit reports, we would have expressed a negative opinion. So we would have said that nothing has come to our attention in respect of going concern. Now that's been changed around and we have to give a positive conclusion. Uh, which is a subtle change, but it, it does change what we need to do in order to make that um, to make that statement. So in terms of going concern, our starting point is always management's assessment about going concern and also management's assessment about whether a material uncertainty exists. So then we look at that assessment and we look at the related disclosures in the financial statements. So this is where we'd look at what you might refer to as the accounting policies or the basis of prep or note one or two uh, to see how their assessment has been disclosed. And then we'll form our conclusion. Um, if we move to the next slide, a big topic of conversation that you will have potentially had with your auditors this year is around material uncertainty. And as I've said, it's management's, um, management's responsibility to form a conclusion of whether there is a material uncertainty in relation to going concern. So what is a material uncertainty? Um, I've pulled out here the, the definition. So it's an event or condition that may cast significant doubt about the ability of an entity to continue as a going concern. So when there's, a going, when there's a material uncertainty, it's not saying that, that, that the entity isn't a going concern. What it's actually saying is on balance, um, you believe that it is a going concern. You would believe that the account should be drawn upon a going concern basis. But actually, there is an event or condition that casts a little bit of doubt. And what you're doing is drawing the user of the account's attention to that fact. Now, in practice, um, we've seen situations where there's a material uncertainty. This might be that you need to, in your forecast, show that you're reliant on a bank overdraft. And in the assessment period, say in six months time, that, uh, that overdraft needs to be renewed. So, um, you know, at this point in time, you have no assurance that that will be renewed. So potentially that is a material uncertainty or maybe in a group situation where traditionally group entities have offered support to each other. But actually looking at that support, it's not legally binding. So whilst you might be satisfied that that support would be forthcoming, there's nothing from a legal nature would mean that it would definitely be provided. So, again, that could be a material uncertainty. So if we move to the next slide. So what is the impact of all of this on the current year audit? So um, first of all, like the um, accounting estimates change, um, we'll be looking at this much earlier in the auditing process. So we'll be looking at during the audit planning phase and we are required to look at it in that point, at that point in time when we're forming our risk assessment. So we need the going concern assessment from our clients at that point in time at the start of the audit. Um, you'll see more challenge of how that assessment's been prepared. Um, we do then have a requirement um, in terms of reporting to those charged with management. So if we ask for that assessment at the planning phase and it's not available or it's insufficient, then we are actually required to report that to those charged with governance. Uh, just, just something to be, to be aware of there. Um, the assessment should cover at least 12 months from the date the financial statements are expected to be signed. 
So um, I think we found quite a lot in practice this year that those dates are a bit longer than they have been in previous years. So it's just thinking about that length of time and that period of assessment, maybe to go slightly further into the future than you generally would have done in, in different years. Um, what you'll probably ask for is more documentary evidence. So maybe to prepare a paper that, um, that covers those key judgments. So not just we'd require our clients to provide a cash flow forecast, obviously with a charity really thinking about the distinction between whether you have restricted funds, restricted cash, and thinking about any restricted or unrestricted cash flows, very, very key to, to our clients, but also a paper or something to explain the key judgments that have been made in drawing that together. Um, you may be asked to look at um, sensitivity, um, to think about and um, to stress test those forecasts. Um, we understand at the moment that it is very difficult for a lot of our clients to actually pull together forecasts when there is so much uncertainty. So one of the things we may ask is around doing a reverse stress test. So if, if you haven't heard of this before, this is where you stand back and you think, well, actually, what is the point that your business would break? So maybe this is at the point that you would run out of cash or you might breach a covenant you know, in terms of loans. And what we do then is to flex that, that um, forecast to see what, what would have to happen in order to get to that situation. That's sometimes a bit of an easier way to look at things rather than moving things by 10% here and 10% there to try and do some kind of sensitivity. Then you'd look at the outcome. So if, for example, if that meant you'd have to have a 50% drop in income, you'd then and stand back, uh, stand back and think about the likelihood of that actually happening. So it's just a different way that you can look at that forecasting process. Um, as I've said, it's the uh, management's consideration of whether the material uncertainties exist. So if there is anything uncertain in those forecasts, you'd expect some, um, some discussion of that with your audit team. And finally, um, as I've said, it's around the challenge of the disclosure in the financial statements. The starting point for our assessment and our audit are those is uh, management's assessment. And it's what's actually written in that basis of preparation of the financial statements. OK, so if you move on to the next slide. So in terms of our um, audit reports, I thought I'd just run through um, some of the different situations we may have. So, uh, sorry, it's quite a fussy slide here, but if we move along the top row. So if you conclude that the going concern basis is appropriate, um, you conclude you, um, the basis of that preparation is adequately disclosed in the financial statements, and we agree there's no material uncertainty, then you have a clean opinion. Now, following along the same line, if the basis is adequately disclosed, there is a material uncertainty and you adequately disclose that material uncertainty, then again, we would issue a clean opinion. But what we would do is we'd have a specific paragraph called a material uncertainty related to going concern paragraph that we'd include in our financial statements. Now, this is very similar, but not the same as an emphasis of matter, which is probably a concept that you might have heard of um, from um, in the past relation to, to other to other items. But just want to stress there that even if you have a material uncertainty, if it's adequately disclosed, we will still issue a clean audit opinion. Um, where you'd have a qualified opinion is when there's some kind of disagreement or the disclosures are insufficient. So if you if the going concern basis is appropriate and it's not sufficiently disclosed, then we'd have an adverse opinion, which is incredibly rare. And then if we can't conclude on whether the going concern basis is appropriate, then that's where we'd have a disclaimer of our opinion. And again, that's incredibly rare circumstances. The majority of our clients would have a clean opinion or a clean opinion with a material uncertainty paragraph. OK, if we move on to the next slide, please. OK, so I started to talk through some of the updates in terms of our audit reports. Um, so obviously we have the change in terms of going concern. So we're now going to be giving that more of a positive, um, positive conclusion rather than the negative conclusion that we'd had previously. Um, other changes, first of all, layout. We have changed the way our audit reports look in terms of the layout. So they look slightly different and you will see a lot of the text will be the same, but it might be in a slightly different order. Uh, but the other thing I just wanted to draw attention to is there will be for 31st December 2020 year ends onwards, a whole new section in the audit report. It's quite wordy. It's the extent to which the audit was considered capable of detecting irregularities, including fraud. Okay, so quite a mouthful. 
Uh, now, irregularities in this context means acts which are contrary, contrary to prevailing law or regulations. OK, so so what is the implication of this? So what we will have in our audit reports is very bespoke a couple of paragraphs and the types of things that we'll be talking about in there is we will be talking through the relevant laws and regulations and the significance of those to the audit. We'll talk about our assessment of whether the financial statements are susceptible to um, material fraud. Um, we'll talk about um, some of the internal controls and procedures that have been designed and the work we've done to look at those. And then we'll talk through some of the procedures that we've done as part of our audit in order to, um, to respond to any of those risks. So uh, just something for you to be aware of, and particularly even from a practical perspective, if you're, if you're someone who pulls the accounts together and you need the number of pages for the audit report, just expect it to look a little bit different and actually to be a bit longer than it has been in previous years. OK, that was everything from me. Thank you, Liz. I think we're going to hand over to Fiona. Super. Can I just have a quick check that you can hear me? Perfect. Brilliant. Thanks. So great. So thanks ever so much for that, Liz. Um, so and good morning. Um, my session um, is specifically looking at the trustees report. Uh, if you could just move on to the next slide, please. So in this session, um, what I really want to cover is some tips and best practice for you to consider as you as you think about preparing for the coming reporting season. So I'm going to touch on expectations from the Financial Reporting Council based on their review of the 2020 reporting cycle, um, give you some feedback on Section 172 reports for larger charitable companies. Uh, I'm going to touch on streamlined energy reporting and just a reminder that if you're a December year end, this will be the first time that you've dealt with this. Uh, the Commission did some really helpful um, reviews of uh, defined benefit pension scheme reporting. So I'll just give you some feedback on that. And finally, I'm just going to give you an update on some changes that have come through um, in the autumn uh, related to the Charity Governance Code. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, so the Financial Reporting Council has recently issued its annual end of year letter to chief execs, finance directors and audit committee chairs, setting out its reporting expectations for preparers of accounts for the years ahead. This letter is publicly available on the FRC website for anybody to have a look at. Many of the recommendations and observations they make really apply to all types of organisations and that's why we're flagging it today because they apply equally to charities irrespective of whether they are incorporated or not. So the FRC is highlighting the importance of disclosures when it comes to providing clear, uh, clear understanding of the impact of specific events, both on financial performance, but also uh, on the amounts presented in the balance sheet. In addition, there's even more emphasis on setting out the judgments involved in significant estimation, estimation uncertainty. And there's an expectation of enhanced disclosures of relevant sensitivities and ranges of possible outcomes to help users of accounts understand those assumptions underlying estimates and the extent of the changes that might be reasonably possible in the next 12 months. The two examples of where this might be relevant relate to ongoing effects of the pandemic, which are causing uh, huge amounts of uncertainty and also perhaps the impact of Brexit, which might be the case for charities, including subsidiaries, if you're bringing in goods and services from the EU. Uh, the FRC also outlines its expectations that entities should provide clear climate change disclosures, including an assessment of the impact of climate change on the reporting entity's own activities and their own environmental impact. And I'm going to come on and talk about the SECR reporting requirements shortly. In terms of reporting timetables, uh, given the continuing challenges presented by the pandemic, the FRC are encouraging boards to carefully consider whether they should lengthen their reporting timetables for 2021, continuing to make use of those extensions for accounts filing which remain in place. And to me, this seems like a really sensible response to dealing with uncertainty. And we would certainly recommend that management and trustees do take time to carefully think about whether they need to have a more flexible approach to committee dates and sign offs throughout 2021. In terms of cash flow statements, as noted on the slide, the FRC also highlighted that these are the cash flow statements continue to be the area where their thematic reviews indicate the most frequent material errors. So definitely worth checking whether you have any unusual transactions and whether you have allocated cash flows to the appropriate headings. 
and don't forget the new requirement for a net debt reconciliation to cash flow statements as well. In terms of the section 172 statements, if we could just move to the next slide. Uh, the FRC's review of section 172 statements looked back on the first year of implementation and the reflections really um, focused on the fact that many entities didn't sufficiently explain how had directors had discharged their responsibilities and duties, and in particular the responsibility to have regard to consequences to decisions in the longer term. A number of entities reported on the methods of engagement with stakeholders, but didn't reflect a two-way dialogue or explain how the feedback affected decision making. In the case of charities, um, the statements should also consider uh, how to link engagement with stakeholders with the risks the charity is facing and the impact of those risks on the charity's business model, uh, together with a longer term view of the impacts on the charity being able to deliver its objectives. The FRC's review um, concluded that many organisations had unfortunately treated the requirements as one of compliance instead of reflecting how they'd specifically met the uh, objectives of the, of the 172 statement. From my experience, um, I recognise that many charities have also struggled with aspects of compliance in this area in 2020, so it's certainly something to revisit through 2021. It's quite surprising actually how many charities weren't even able to identify the key decisions that the board had actually made during the year. And as a reminder, there is an information sheet, uh, number three, on these requirements, which is certainly worth having a reflection back on, uh, even if you did put a statement in last year. And we've also collected a bank of really good examples of charities who we think did adopt and embrace, embrace the requirements really well. Uh, some chose to set things out in a narrative, whilst others laid the requirements out in a tabular format. So there are certainly lots of options for how to tackle this. Just moving to the next slide. Um, in terms of stakeholders, Section 172 separates out uh, stakeholders into two groups, with the first one being employees. So I just wanted to reflect here on this slide that there are certainly some really specific areas for the 2021 report that are bound to feature in this area. Um, so how has COVID impacted on furlough decisions, pay and award decisions, and for example, whether you've accessed the coronavirus job retention grants? You probably want to reflect on the physical measures that you've put in place to protect staff who've been unable to work from home and the initiatives that you've offered to employees to help maintain mental health and well-being. Uh, and finally, the extent of homeworking and any support provided for example, the provision of equipment to enable them to carry out their work. So there are all, these are all the things that I think you could probably build into that Section 172 uh, reporting for this year. Just moving on to environmental reporting, as I, as I mentioned in my introduction, if you have a December year end, uh, this will be relevant for the first time. So for periods commencing on or after the 1st of April 2019, charitable companies that are large companies for company law purposes are required to report their UK energy use and associated greenhouse gas emissions, as well as an intensity ratio and information relating to energy efficiency within the trustees report. Again, there is an information sheet on the SORT microsite, which is certainly worth a read to help guide you through the requirements. So trustees and directors will need to report on energy use for the associated greenhouse gas emissions that relate to activities for which the charitable company is responsible for, including the combustion of gas or consumption of fuel for the purposes of transport and the purchase of electricity by the charitable company for its own use, including for the purposes of transport. You must disclose a figure in kilowatt hours of the annual quantity of energy uh, and trustees should consider the act charities activities and supply chains to consider whether all of the relevant energy sources have been um, uh, have been picked up. The regulations are clear that energy means all forms of energy products, including combustible fuels, heat, renewable energies, electricity or any other form of energy. And you then have to translate this into an annual quantity of emissions in tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent resulting from UK energy use uh, to disclose in your report. You also have to put in an intensity ratio, and this is a measure of environmental impact such as greenhouse gases, div divided by the, a relevant commercial metric. And common metrics are turnover or output, but others might be um, income sales or square meters of floor space. 
an annex to the SCCR reporting requirement guidelines provide some common intensity ratios. With the exception of the first year of reporting, uh, information for energy use and greenhouse emissions must be provided for the previous year. So if you have a March year end and already um, complied with this last year, you'll need to now provide the, the current year and the, retain the prior year comparatives as well. If you've taken actions to improve energy efficiency during the financial year covered by the report, you need to provide a description of the principal energy efficiency actions that you've taken. There's no methodology prescribed in the legislation. However, the one adopted must be one based on robust and sound methodologies. Uh, the SECR reporting guidelines recommend that methodologies used are widely recognised independent standards. All of these requirements are contained in the 2018 regulations regulations, but they're also covered by the information sheet that I've just mentioned. Uh, for charities, the disclosures could be set out within the achievements and performance section of the trustee report or in a separate, separate section within the body of your report. You are exempt uh, from the requirements if your energy consumption in the UK is 40,000 kilowatts or less, but in that case you must, dis uh, must state that the disclosures have been not, not been made for that reason. Where it's not practical to obtain some or even all of the information, it can be omitted, but the report must state what information is not included and why. And, and this is only expected to happen in very rare circumstances. Uh, my experience is that many large charities have employed external consultants to help them um, collate the data that's needed to put into the disclosures. But actually lots of smaller entities have also been able to pull the relevant information together themselves. And just a quick reminder, um, the rules apply to larger charitable entities if you have two out of the three, which is income of more than 36 million, a balance sheet total of more than 18 million and more than 250 employees. However, what I would say is that I, I'm picking up a lot of interest in this area, even from smaller charities, and therefore, like a lot of reporting areas, I expect to see some best practice emerging for across the sector, irrespective of whether it's a mandatory uh, disclosure at this point. So next slide, please. So uh, just moving on to a completely different topic area in terms of defined benefit pension schemes. Um, we recognise obviously that there are significant estimates which form the basis of the calculation of liabilities and funding of DB schemes is, is clearly an ongoing risk and a, and a cause for uncertainty for many charities. So in 2020, the Commission specifically focused on a review of reporting of pension scheme deficits. They undertook a desktop review initially of 100 sets of accounts and then picked up direct engagement with around 40 charities. Their review was specifically focusing on whether trustees had obtained up-to-date valuations for their pension schemes, whether they'd considered the implications on the charity's finances from the latest actuarial valuation, in light of the funding requirements reviewed, whether there was any risk to the charity's ability to continue to deliver its objectives, uh, whether trustees had obtained specialist advice, and finally, whether there was a clear explanation of the pension scheme position in the accounts uh, and disclosed the risks and uncertainties. Very encouragingly and almost quite rare, the conclusion from the Commission was that these risks were really being managed very well. However, what they did reflect on was that um, the report, the trustees report didn't always set out clearly enough these, these areas. So again, it would be my recommendation that if you have a defined benefit pension scheme that you reflect back on the disclosures that you put in the accounts, picking up these areas that the commission were interested in. And finally, just moving on to uh, the refreshed charity governance code. So the updated 2020 code um, has resulted from a really rigorous consultation process with the sector in uh, during last year, which received over 800 responses. Uh, the consultation report was published in August and, and included the key themes identified. This has resulted in a refresh rather than an overhaul of the governance code. And this reflects feedback that the steering group recognise that they must strike a balance between continually updating the code and potentially disrupting embedding the code's use. So there's two changes. There's an enhancement to the principle three on uh, integrity um, and, a, and a refreshed uh, review of the previous principle six diversity, which is now called equality, diversity and inclusion, EDI. 
these were the principles that received the most consistent feedback in the consultation as the areas where change was required. With regards to the integrity principle, um, the focus of this one has just broadened. The 2017 version of the principle was primarily concerned with protecting charity assets and reputation. Uh, the new version places increased emphasis on values, culture and the right of everyone to be safe. And this reflects developments in the sector as well as incorporating NCVO's charity ethical principles. In addition to existing practices on conflicts of interest, the code now expects trustees to assess and address power imbalances where they might exist, understand their safeguarding responsibilities, establish appropriate procedures that are integrated with the charity's risk management approach, and make sure that everyone in contact with the charity knows how to speak up and raise concerns. With regard to the EDI principle, the consultation was clear that the former diversity principle could go further in terms of supporting trustees to plan and work toward board diversity, as well as creating inclusive cultures both inside the board and throughout the organisation. And the updated code is therefore designed to help charities on this journey. This principle has been completely redrafted. Uh, hence the revised name uh, for the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And it recommends four stages of practice for charities in their EDI journey. Firstly, define how equality, diversity and inclusion are important for the charity and assess the current level of understanding. Secondly, set out plans and targets tailored for the charity based on its context and starting point. Uh, thirdly, monitor and measure how well the charity is doing. And finally, be transparent and publish the charity's progress. So again, my recommendation is that if you've had a statement in your accounts previously to say that the charity has uh, taken on board the recommendations of the Charity Governance Code and believes that it complies or applies those principles, now would be a really good time to think about how the refreshed areas um, that I've just referred to might change um, how you disclose um, your application of the code in the coming reporting season. So that's all from me and I'm going to hand over to Matthew. Thanks Fiona. Um, just, a, just a quick one before Matthew um, starts his session. We've had a lot of queries coming through on the end of session, especially I'll pick a number of those up in the Q&A. Um, but if we, we have also been answering some of those live as, as well. So hopefully you'll be able to see some of the, the question and answers um, coming through from that. So over to Matthew. Thanks very much, uh, Jill. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Matthew Tate. I'm a business restructuring uh, partner uh, within um, our uh, uh, business restructuring department. Um, today, I'm going to take you a few, uh, through a few things. Um, firstly, the, just if you can move on to the next slide, please. I'm going to take you through three slides, um, which, is, which I'm going to broadly describe as the bad, the interesting and the uncertain. So if we can just move to the next slide, please. Now, what this uh, slide, um, who, who, just so you know, this comes from our, we did a retail update in business restructuring. We spoke to a number of the lenders, private equity, as well as uh, uh, audit clients within, within, within retail at the beginning of the year. Um, so we set a financial uh, uh, and economic uh, picture to, as a basis to our presentation. Um, as you can see from, from this slide, sorry that uh, the numbers might be a little bit difficult to, to, to read, but uh, the UK, in terms of the impact of the pandemic on our GDP, is a uh, forecast uh, total contraction of, a, of originally a 1% 2020 uh, increase to 11.5% decrease, so a 12.5% swing. Uh, that is second only to, to, to Spain. Um, so that's really what the, what the bad is. Um, we can move on to the, uh, to the second slide, please. Um, this is, the, this is the interesting uh, bit. You may have read this in the press. It, it's been sort of trailed by various economists, just to be make it absolutely clear. Uh, I myself am not an economist. Um, but what this, uh, what this slide shows is uh, the propensity of the UK uh, um, uh, people to save money and then spend it. So rather unusually, uh, um, com and pat particularly compared to other Western economies, uh, we have a propensity to spend. And the, one of the impacts of the pandemic is that we have been unable to spend. 
And broadly, what that means and what this, slow, this slide uh, shows is that, um, which is a ratio of household uh, savings, uh, uh, which is calculated relatively simply on the basis of disposable income, um, shows that uh, during the course of the pandemic, the amount of savings within a certain strata of society has, ro has rocketed, as defined by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, that's middle class, they have um, obviously a sort of C, C to A uh, type, type uh, differentiation there. Um, but what it means is that there is about £350 per month that has accrued in certain parts of our uh, 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 populace's bank accounts during the course of the pandemic. And that then compares to £170, which is the opposite of that, I, the, where they are, worth, that they are worse off. And I put that up because from a retail perspective, that's extremely important for them in terms of their planning, but also from a charitable perspective where if it is an avenue uh, for a charity to, to source donations from, from, from the general public, then it would be, I think, quite interesting to know that. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. Now, this is from the, uh, the, from the OBR's uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, forecasts. Um, there are a number of things I want to say about, about this slide. The, the number one uh, thing that I'm going to say it is that it is uh, right at the heart of what I'm going to be talking about today. Whereas my, my previous uh, speakers, uh, and particularly Elizabeth Carr, who, who was building on the very technical requirements uh, as are required with going concern considerations, I'm going to be speaking more practically uh, about from a business restructuring perspective where I spend a, a large proportion of my time within the corporate world, but also with a number of exempt charities uh, particularly within our education uh, sector, is that forecasts are quite often challenged as being uh, uh, broadly out of date as soon as they are produced. Um, I think that that is a fallacy, and I think that that is something which has to fundamentally change, and maybe the events over the last year are something uh, it maybe gives a greater impetus for that change. The uh, uh, the fallacy is that, uh, that as soon as they are produced, they have uh, no, no relevance to the business. It's something which I hear quite a lot from board directors. Uh, my view is that the, that the issue uh, there is that that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the purpose of a financial forecast is going to be. And that is that it has two uses. The one is that it is a management tool by which other decisions that are later made are going to be judged. Therefore, it fits wholly within the relevance of a going concern consideration. And the second is it is a method by which um, stakeholders and other third parties are brought to, to an agreed platform of information such that they can buy into a future strategy, not knowing necessarily what the outcome may be. In other words, it is a tool of persuasion, not necessarily of determination. Now, what this uh, slide shows, if you look at the yellow line, that was the OBR's forecast uh, pre-pandemic as to how the economy would grow. You'll note that it's not greatly spectacular, um, but clearly that also had built within it a Brexit uh, 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 impact, uh, which was going to be a lag on, on the economy. Then the various coloured lines are firstly the actual outturn, which is in black, and there are two other lines, and then there's a grey uh, band. That is the corridor of uncertainty, which I think they seem to remember as a cricketing term. Um, but the corridor of uncertainty in this, in this side uh, ranges from a return to relative uh, uh, growth and normality ranging somewhere between uh, uh, um, Q4 of 2021 to Q4 of 2024. So then otherwise there is a very broad range of, uh, uh, of sort of diversion against the, return, the timeline to the return to the norm. Importantly also, any forecast like this, which is again what comes down to a management tool, is shown as a straight line projection or a smooth line, my apologies, a smooth line projection, whereas actually the, the, the pathway to it is much more likely to be jagged. So if we can move to the next slide, please. What I'm trying to do in this, uh, in this section is just to address the question of uncertainty. Now, Elizabeth has already uh, provided a detailed uh, analysis of material uncertainty. I'm talking here about business uncertainty and the primary tools by which it can be managed and indeed from our point of view should be managed. If I can move to the next slide, please. So the, the setting for, her, for this, the objective is to uh, 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 raise the question as how to best promote informed going concern uh, uh, conversations. Let me just move to my notes. 
Um, <clears throat> the primary risk uh, that's established itself since March of last year is the uncertainty that the, the, the degree to which matters may change outside of an individual business or charity's control at short notice for which uh, quite fundamental decisions should be made. Um, what that, uh, what that, that, that requires upon a trustee is, uh, of a charity and those advising the trustee is a deep understanding of the variables and sensitivities that may uh, arise. Um, what we are recommending, sorry, what I am recommending is that uh, time is invested in a robust and integrated forecast model. Now, uh, uh, I think it's not necessarily clear what uh, uh, that in integrated forecast model is. I'm gonna keep it in relatively straightforward terms, is that the cash flow balance sheet and profit and loss, which is what the, what the uh, corporates would call it, um, are integrated through a collective set of uh, assumptions such that the impact on those three key uh, 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 statements can be modelled relatively simply as circumstances change. What that means, if that time and investment is made, is that a board will able to uh, support management's decision making and the, the, the range of management's uh, decision, decision making. Importantly, it also assists trustees in the compliance with their duties. Um, we've previously produced information relation in relating to the changes in the law uh, as impact directors' duties. There was not a not a not a complete release, but a, certainly a relaxation of the interpretation at which directors may become liable uh, for, uh, for for various matters. It doesn't remove the liability entirely. Um, but it does substantially uh, mitigate it. Uh, as I've already said, uh, the communication of a, uh, an integrated model would greatly improve communications, in particular with a number of the banks that we deal with. Uh, it won't come as a surprise that uh, uh, our view with banking relationships going forward is that uh, once the pa uh, pandemic is broadly agreed to have been brought under control, let's for the sake of argument say towards the end of this year, that bank, the banks themselves will be looking to repair their own balance sheets. And as risk is built into the economy, where um, there are forecasts for increased unemployment, uh, for business failure uh, to increase because government support, uh, essentially prohibiting business failure at the moment, will be withdrawn, that they will be looking to their uh, covenant compliance to ensure that as businesses do recover, the banks themselves uh, a share in the potentiality and benefits and upsides of that recovery. So if we can move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I see it, we have two sides of the track. Um, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the greatest benefit of uh, integrated financial planning modeling is that we have uh, on one, the, the one side, downside planning and statutory risk ma management, the statutory risk management being the, uh, the director's duties or, or trustee's duties. Um, just to finish up on the trustee's duties point of view, uh, the Charity Commission uh, uh, commission have said that whilst the trustees aren't explicitly dealt with in the changes to director's liability at the moment, they will be highly persuaded by them. So I think we can, we can assume that they will be treated one and the same in terms of the compliance with the duties established under the Trustees Act. So, um, uh, uh, but what it also brings in is from a downside planning is to, for, for all charities, all businesses, in fact, to understand what their key performance indicators are. Uh, there is a great deal of similarity between a key performance indicator and uh, a, a primary assumption, which would be driving the integrated financial model. Uh, integrated financial models themselves are active management tools. I am commonly asked as to what is the, the, the kind of gradation by which the model should be produced. Broadly, uh, we would recommend uh, close to a week by week analysis for the first 13 weeks and then a month by month analysis uh, beyond that. However, that is a, 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 an answer that's, that, that's based uh, uh, with an assumption that there is a relatively high degree of stress within a business. Uh, my view uh, for the purposes of this forum is that a monthly integrated model covering a space of three years in total uh, would be more than a suffi sufficient and most probably quite a stretch objective. So therefore a 12, a 12 month, month by month analysis would, uh, would broadly meet uh, the, the, the purposes for, um, for my recommendation. Uh, on the other platform, <coughs> we have 
uh, what we view in, in business restructuring, where we spend a, a, a very significant proportion of our time, which is advising businesses as to how to make themselves, uh, both from an operational point of view and also from a financial point of view, uh, uh, both effective and, and efficient. The, uh, the integrated model assists in that because it can show or highlight areas where there should be focused by a board or a management team. Uh, in particular, the big three areas, which are identified as the last three bullet points on the right hand side there, which is a review of costs. So the contracts that the charity has entered into, how its suppliers work, the terms and conditions of the, of the suppliers, what are its policies for the management of, of, it, of, of its control, its uh, uh, signing off procedures, its recording procedures. Then we have the working capital itself, if you have facilities available, but noting uh, 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 as I've just said, that the banks, we think later on in this year, will be taking more of an acute look at, uh, at, at facilities, but also uh, recognising that within charities with restricted and unrestricted under and unrestricted funds, there may be greater challenge. And that looking at working capital uh, uh, and noting uh, that if you have a, a, a reliance on, more, for example, the, the uh, um, uh, individual donations, we think there might be an increase coming on later on this year because of uh, available cash, but from a, a return on, on, on equities, bonds, government yields, etc., cetera, uh, uh, th those sort of policies are gonna to need to be carefully reviewed. Um, just as a point of interest, uh, the, uh, the UK relatively recently issued a three-year government bond at negative rate. In other words, the government is going to be paying the lender for the, for, for the pleasure of borrowing £3.6 billion. Pounds. That's for three-year money. So uh, uh, there are certain type of instruments where returns are going to be extremely low. Um, the third, sorry, the last bullet point or the third point of, of, of the benefit is the review of operations uh, processes that could, could, could return benefit to a charity. And we would include that, these uh, estates uh, uh, strategy, which we know is of a very significant uh, uh, concern to a number of, uh, uh, of charities, as well as obviously retailers. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, and before I move on this slide, I just want to highlight the word reasonable, uh, reasonable questions. Uh, reasonable is a term which you will be very familiar with um, uh, with your audit relations as well as uh, various other uh, uh, financial advisors. Um, within what I do, uh, reasonableness has a very fundamental um, uh, uh, impact. If we can just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, one of my roles is I'm what's called an office holder, which means I'm licensed by, uh, by, uh, by, by the uh, um, Secretary of State to accept insolvency appointments. And very specifically, I'm licensed to accept uh, 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 insolvency appointments that are within the edu education sphere. And one of my appointments is I am the administrator of Handlow and West Kent Colleges, uh, further education colleges, uh, which were referenced in the VAT talk earlier um, with, with regard to the Lennox. Uh, outcome. The reason I mention that is, is that rather unusually, uh, as a partner of BDO, one of the issues I face is that I am subject to the same uh, strictures and uh, and review and challenge uh, that a trustee is. And so I do understand from, from when you are making decisions what it feels like when you're sitting in that seat. Um, what BDO has done to assist boards is uh, we have a, an area of our, of our website, and it will, hopefully it will be a term uh, that's familiar to you, which is rethink. This current slide summarizes at a very high level the various phases that we think rethink uh, should be applied by all boards, whether that be corporates or charities. Um, uh, we uh, would consider that the vast ma majority of businesses, if not all, are out of the first uh, column, which is the safeguarding your business. Uh, uh, the react phase that you're long far way, way down the resilience phase and the, uh, the, the, the introduction of, of detailed integrated modeling would assist that resilience aspect, but also then enable you to leap forward and realize gains, uh, opportunities, changes uh, that are made. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go through the next two slides in any great detail. I'm also aware of the time. Um, but I have set out within this presentation what uh, a number of questions that we think uh, would be of great use uh, to boards, trustees, finance directors, uh, finance departments to ensure that they are, are they are questioning whether it be from a balance sheet uh, uh, position or indeed from from the sofa uh, it, it, it itself. Um, 
If you move to the next slide, please. Reasonable question two. So the statement of financial activities, um, we would uh, just to highlight a couple of, of, the, uh, of the questions that are, that are, are, are on there. Um, it is firstly the uh, security of existing income streams and the ability to find adequate alternative sources. Uh, hopefully I've given a, a couple of highlights uh, there as to the view where we think money may be stored or storing up in the economy. And that 100 million that we're estimating there uh, is more likely to, so 100 million, it's 100 billion, uh, 120 billion now, uh, which is a very significant uh, proportion of the chancellor's spend on dealing with COVID. Um, then we also have a focus within there on, on contractual management, uh, cost management, property management, estate strategy. So as I say, there are a number of questions there which we think might be helpful to the board or, or, or indeed finance directors or finance departments, uh, departments to, uh, 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 to, to question. Um, however, we have to in, uh, uh, in, ensure that we do uh, uh, make some form of assessment as to what happens if the reasonable conclusion is that things are really very, very difficult and a very radical restructuring is, uh, is required. Now, I think really in terms of prior to the pandemic, radical instruction would automatically lead to issues, firstly, relating to disclosure to the Charity Commission, because there are very specific duties to do so that on the sort of material change uh, uh, duties, material uh, 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 uncertainty. Uh, but post the pandemic, I think one of the very good benefits that we've had from a corporate law and charity law perspective, because it is available to charities broadly, is the introduction of the Corporate uh, uh, Insolvency Governance, uh, Governance Act. If you can move on two slides, please. Thank you very much. Now, again, we are on the BDO website. We have a space that deals with uh, uh, the, the, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, uh, which provides uh, uh, quite a lot of detail as well as we made a very specific charity uh, comment, which is also on, on the website. For those who are unfamiliar with uh, uh, one very specific and we think very important part of the, uh, um, uh, of the CIGA is the introduction of the moratorium and monitorship uh, process followed by the restructuring plan. Critically, it is not an insolvency process, but at high level, it looks like one. Um, what that means is that there is a moratorium to enable a charity uh, 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 to formulate its restructuring plans to have protection against enforcement uh, from, from creditors, uh, including uh, landlords. It has, uh, 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 and, and importantly, certainly from a governance perspective, the way the Charity Commissioner looks at it, the charities uh, uh, directors or trustees remain in control and drive that, drive that plan. A plan is put together and an application can be made to, uh, to the court to enact uh, a restructuring plan. So uh, 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 the, uh, the key there, the restructuring plan as sanctioned by the court, is that it has what's called a cram down ability. And a cram down in, in restructuring terms means it has the ability to, uh, to, to bind creditors uh, to a plan, even though they don't agree with it. So as you see on the second to the line, I think it's quite near the close to the bottom, allows for cram down or cram up of dissenting creditors binding on that dissenting class. So um, it could, uh, if, if, it, if the model that is produced shows that a fundamental restructuring uh, is required, um, this is broadly available to, to, to a number of charity, charity entities and their structures. Um, it uh, would enable quite a radical restructuring to go to go through on a quasi consensual basis, but with the authority of a court order. So sorry, that was a bit of a rapid run through my presentation. Um, it's now my uh, job to hand over to Caroline Jones and to Katie Hampton. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about national minimum wage today. Um, I'm an employment tax director and I specialise in all things employment tax. You might think national minimum wage is not a tax, but actually it falls within our remit. And I'm joined today by Katie Hampton. Um, she's been with the firm for about 18 months and she was previously a national minimum wage inspector at HMRC. So she's a great person to be talking to us about what the issues may be for the charity sector. 
Now, I guess you may be thinking, well, we could be accredited living wage employers. We could be, um, you know, we're happy that we're paying national minimum wage. But I think what you'll see as we go through this is that there are particular areas where you could um, fall foul of the rules. So if we could just move to the next slide um, really quickly. So this just gives a flavour of some of those employers who have been named and shamed so far. Uh, the latest list came out in December 2020. And you'll see on here, there's some big names. I think most of these employers probably thought that they too were paying national minimum wage, but they were just caught out by the technicalities. So I'm going to hand over to Katie and she's going to explain to you wh why there may be an issue for um, charities. What was really interesting earlier, I thought, was um, when Glyn was talking, he mentioned, does HMRC go after charities? I think the answer to that is yes. And I think there are some risk areas that charities really need to be thinking about at the moment. So if I can hand over to Katie, please. Wonderful. Well, thanks for that, Caroline. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, just before we move on from this slide, I think it's um, you know really important. Although these are absolutely the headlines in my experience um, of working for HMRC, I don't believe that it's your rogue employers that are finding themselves in this position. The majority are good employers and organisations that are trying to do the right thing, but from technical misunderstandings or from just not having robust policies and procedures in place. They're finding themselves in this really costly um, and damaging, damaging position. So if we move on to the next slide, we're going to do a, a whistle-stop tour of um, how HMRC have evolved over the last couple of years. Some touch on some areas within charities that I think might be um, areas that you need to be mindful of to see if it's something that you, you currently do. The consequences of having a breach and then why being proactive is absolutely key. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide. Um, so the introduction of minimum wage has absolutely been transformative for the UK labour market and increasing pay for the lower paid workers. But it's definitely become a minefield for employers trying to navigate through the complexities of the rules. Um, and in my opinion, I don't believe historically this is an area that employers realised how complex it was. And I don't think that advisors were really talking about the, this particular subject in great detail, other than to say, hey, here's an update with the increased rates, make sure you uplift them. Um, but the devil really is in the detail. And, you know, I think that has started to change. There's definitely been a shift in more employers starting to bring it up the agenda and recognising how important it is to proactively look at that. And that's because the government have invested a substantial amount of budget into changing the way that they enforce minimum wage. Um, and what that's allowed HMRC is to do is to rapidly increase their resources. There's been a shift in strategy in the type of work and the type of employer that they go after and target. Um, the enforcement toolkit is definitely strengthened. So we've got 200% penalties on um, areas that are identified and the, the naming and shaming as, as well, um, which we're gonna touch on further as we go along. But I think that shift has definitely been evident in HMRC's record breaking results in the amount of money that they've been identifying um, due back to workers. We just look at that historically was 3.2 million, whereas the latest is, is up to 24 million, definitely a shift and similar with penalties as well, less than 1 million up to 17 million now. It's a huge um, you know, change and shift in that. So if we move on to the next slide, so as Glyn was touching on around that question, you know, do HMRC treat charities differently? Um, historically, I would say HMRC hadn't actively targeted um, charities very much. Um, they were too busy do, dealing with 100% complaints. So really dealing with more rogue and serious and deliberate non-compliance. So great work, you know, really on the front line helping workers. But the shift in the last couple of years means that HMRC have now got a team that are actively targeting specific sectors. And they're also looking at businesses that have never been audited before. So if you've never had a minimum wage inquiry before, this is an incredible opportunity to get your ducks in order before that letter lands on the doorstep. Because we have definitely started to see more charities now coming up for inspection. Um, and also this is will be around um, you know, HMRC doing a campaign to educate more workers than ever. So they're really encouraging more workers, spending millions to 
you know, on text messaging and billboards and educating workers to tell them to come forward and raise a complaint. Um, their employer, if they believe they're not being paid minimum wage. So we're definitely seeing them targeting specific sectors, but there's more coming through within charity. So it's a perfect opportunity to really look at this to see if there's any changes that are needed within your policies and procedures. So we'll just touch on the next slide. I just want to touch on a couple of the common areas um, or just why, why are you getting caught? Why are your business is getting caught out? Simply the lack of awareness, I would say, is the biggest point. It's very complex legislation. And I do think there's this you know, misconception around, well, if we pay the rates that are published or um, you know, we're, credited, we're credited with the living wage, then we should be absolutely fine. But it really is the devil is in the details. So if we switch on to the next slide, I'm just going to touch on some of these areas. Um, there's lots of complex areas within minimum wage that you can get, have a, um, you know, a breach. But some of the ones that I think would be more relevant to you would be, um, you know, deductions and salary sacrifice is a good one to start with. Um, you know, this is definitely a common area where if you don't have the right checks in place and you're offering great benefit schemes or people are putting large, large sums into pensions or cycle to work or, um, you know, childcare vouchers, any salary sacrifice should never bring workers below minimum wage. So it's really key area of, you know, common, um, you know, complexity, especially even if you've got people that are significantly higher rate peers that are deciding to put a lot more money into their pensions. You know, it really needs to be that there's still checks to make sure that minimum wages is being paid because HMRC will still actively go after that mistake even if you've got someone paid a significantly high salary. Um, so salary sacrifice is definitely a key area. Deductions, again, if you have any benefits or any deductions that are not your statutory tax and national insurance and auto enrolment, I would say you would need to make sure that they are compliant and minimum wage. Um, you know, a substantial amount of money has been identified in these areas around benefit schemes, um, Christmas savings clubs, um, and the likes of, and stuff like that. So I'm not going into any more detail on that because I'm always short on time. Uniform, and another another really complex area. If there's any requirement for people to be wearing specific dress codes, you know, an example of that is black shoes or black trousers, um, and you're not compensating for that money, you know, HMRC will look to see what the implications around that are around minimum wage. So again, another area of common mistake volunteers i would say this is probably an area and um, that you're definitely you know you using again this is a really common area and, and very complex so what hmrc will look at is making sure that your paperwork which is covering a voluntary a voluntary arrangement is definitely um you know hitting that criteria and then what they'll look at is what actually happens in practice so you know looking at what restrictions are put on voluntary workers? Is there any promise of jobs uh, or any promise of benefits and money? Even if that is, you know, vouchers and, and, and things like that, you need to be really mindful of how that's set up to make sure HMRC um, would not challenge it. The worker type, um, you know, we can go on for a day around that, but salaried workers has a really strict criteria and you can only be considered to be salaried for minimum wage purposes if you hit that complex criteria so you know being aware of that is is also important and um, if we want to move on to the next slide then so the consequences of having a breach can be really costly and really damaging so hmrc will usually through inspection not just come out and and get a good idea of how you operate but then they'd like to interview workers to make sure that you know there isn't what said at the work, you know, what was said at the initial interview, um, it, does that correspond with what's happening actually in practice? Um, so yeah, and they'll be looking at also then, you know, contracts and, and staff handbooks and, and things like that. Now, if a, a breach has been identified, what HMRC do is they will look over a period of the last six years and any underpayments that are identified they need to be uplifted to the current rates of minimum wage. And that includes current and ex-workers. 
So that figure alone can be a significant figure, as well as that you, on top of arrears, you would then have your employment costs, um, you know, your national mix and stuff like that, employers mix. Once that's been identified, HMRC charge a, a penalty of up to 200% now. So, um, and, and it's very different to taxes. You can't negotiate on your penalties. It's very, very different. It's calculated based on the underpayment. And then unfortunately, it will be put in, being put forward for naming and shaming. Um, there has been a temporary pause on the naming and shaming, which has now, um, you know, just been released again. And over 140 employers were labelled as rogue employers. Um, you know, even though many of them were good employers just trying to do the right thing and, and was because of benefit packages. Um, just one final thought. So if we just switch on to the last slide. Sorry, I'm going super quick. Um, but what we would absolutely recommend is being proactive really is key because if you get your ducks in order before the letter lands on the doorstep from HMRC, you know, you're minimising that risk of 200% penalties. There's no on, there's no penalties if the issue has been rectified and money's being paid back and you also don't get put forward for naming and shaming. So definite benefits to, to review and policies and procedures on a proactive basis. And that's it. Um, hopefully, I know that was super quick, people understood me um, there, but if I just pass over to either Caroline or Jill or... Yeah, so, so if I could just say a couple of things then as we finish. So... Um, I did some work in the university sector. In fact, I worked in the university sector for a year um, and they have charitable status and they are having issues with volunteers in particular. So Katie picked up a, a couple of issues. There are you know, lots and lots that you could fall foul of, but I think volunteers probably in the charitable sector and salary sacrifice are the two major ones. So thank you for that, Katie. I'm going to hand back to Jill then to round up. Thanks, and, and very conscious of time, apologies um to our participants that we've gone slightly over what we have been trying to do is answer the the q a um live so hopefully you've seen some of the answers and and i'm going to ask our team to just collate all of those and to send them round as we send the full slide pack and the recording round early next week so a real quick summary from me um ellen gave us a huge amount of information um, there's a lot going on in the back front Manage, uh, managing tax digital is coming like a like a train early April and we are going to be issuing either another webinar or an article um, in relation to MTD we've had a, quite a few questions um, on that um, this session talked us through the changes um, not so much on the the accounting standards front thankfully um, but two key auditing standards that have changed so really just a, a key takeaway from that is do expect a few more questions um, around accounting estimates and going concern at an earlier stage in the audit. Um, Fiona took us through um, a lot of information. I know we've had a lot of questions, especially on the environmental reporting, which I'm, I'm going to put on in a, in a second if people still are able to hang on. Um, but I think really the key takeaway from that is just to take time around the trustees report. Um, stakeholders uh, requirements are changing. And there's been a lot of best practice um, come out over 2020. So looking for you know, those key disclosures over those areas that Fiona went through, I think you know, investing that time will be, will be key. Matthew gave us a lot of information around going concern and reforecasting. And, and the biggest factor for businesses, you know, if that is uncertainty for you, then investing that time and thought upfront to get that integrated financial model, I think would be a really, really sensible use of, of precious resource. And finally, from Katie and, and Caroline, I think don't think that even if you are accredited as a, a living wage employer, that you can't fall foul of those rules. There's a lot of complexity in there um, and a lot more interest, I think, from the revenue. So those are my kind of key takeaways. Um, the people that we, Appreciate we are running over time, but people that if they can stay on and, and would like to hear a few uh, Q&As from, uh, from the panel, I'll ask the panel to pop on their um, cameras and I will take a few questions. We won't keep you, keep you too long. Um, as we said at the start, Glyn has left us, um, but we will circulate the Q&A from the VAT session um, 
with the slides. So I think first question probably for Liz. Um, Liz, you talked about the review of estimates and a retrospective look at those estimates. Do you think that will lead to any prior year adjustments in the accounts? Um, yes, in this one, probably not. Um, just to clarify, in terms of the retrospective review, that's actually part of our risk assessment um, process. So what we do during our um, planning is we'd look at the um, how effective the processes were in the prior year in terms of forming that estimate. We'd look at if there was a different outcome, we'd look at the reason for the change. But then we'd also look if there was any management bias in actually forming that estimate. Now, when we'd really think about this is, is there actually an error? You would only make a prior period adjustment if we could be certain that it's actually a prior period um, error that's material. So um, in terms of an estimate being an error, it would only be an error if the information... Um, was available in the prior year or could reasonably be expected um, to be obtained and taken into account. So, as I say, there is a possibility there could be, if there was a, a material error, um, a prior period adjustment. But on the whole, we just wouldn't really expect to see that. Thanks, Liz. That's really helpful. Um, a couple of questions for uh, Fiona, if that's OK. Um, one comment around senior finance managers have an awful lot on their plate at the moment um, and the audit uh, doesn't help with this due to the raft of additional information we've just been through. Um, are there any areas of the audit which you think are now less important where time could be saved? Um, I'd love to answer that question with a yes <laughs> but unfortunately I don't think it is the case. I think um, yeah unfortunately the requirements and the regulations seem to be growing um, and therefore we have to respond accordingly. I think it is also it is really important though that as clients you really engage with us at the planning process when we have that initial discussion to really identify what the real risks of material misstatement are and not to fall into the trap of just sort of rolling forward things from one year to the next. So we always challenge our teams to you know plan an audit as if it was the first audit um, each year. Um, so I think I would just engage with your client teams very early on in the cycle to say you know what what is a risk this year but more importantly what might have been a risk in the past that we really don't um, for whatever reason we don't need to focus on this year so I think that that discussion will hopefully bear fruit in terms of um, an increased focus on the things that do matter. Great thanks Fiona and a, a bit of interest around section 172 report. Um, yeah. And just whether we could share best practice examples. Yeah, so I think the, my strong recommendation there is, again, to, to engage with your client teams directly as part of the planning process um, and ask them to um, give you some examples of things that they think are, are best practice. I think in terms of um, planning for a Section 172 report, where I've seen clients tackle it really positively is where there is a, um, some slow thinking that goes in at the early stages to really define who your stakeholders actually are um, and, and therefore how you how you've engage with them. Obviously, from a charitable perspective, we would expect beneficiaries to be very high up there in terms of the list of stakeholders. You'll also have things like other partners that you work with, um, obviously employees and regulators. Um, and then sort of filter down into what are the key decisions and considerations that you've made during the year. So, um, I mentioned that the format could vary, but actually I quite like the tabular format because I think it does drive that thinking around who stakeholders are, what you've done in each uh, with each stakeholder during the year and, and your considerations and, and board decisions that sort of feed out of that. Thank you. And probably a, a mean question, but we've had it twice in two different two different ways. So I, I'm going to ask it. I don't know the answer to this. So um, it's, a, it's a great question, actually. And, we, you know, in light of the last um, 10 months, as most of our activities have now been transferred away from the offices and into our homes, um, how could that be calculated and should that be disclosed? Well, behind the scenes, we... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so behind the scenes when that question popped up, we obviously have uh, doing, been doing a little bit of researching and talking to our, our sort of technical colleagues as well. And um, what we've understood from, from, from that particular question is that no, home working energy consumption is specifically excluded or, or more precisely, it's part of an area of voluntary disclosure rather than mandatory disclosure. So you, you don't need to start trying to collate information about every single individual person working at home and, and, and what their energy consumption is really helpful thank you super super quick response there brilliant uh, matthew on your session uh, we have a question in saying what are the key adaptations required for going concern um, to be applicable for grant making foundations rather than fundraising charities i'm going to slightly avoid that question that sounds like quite a technical question as to the uh, requirements of the grant making uh, bodies them, the, 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 themselves. Just to set the context of what I'm when I'm talking about uh, going concern, I'm using from my audit colleagues' uh, definition from the point at which the audit is is signed off a 12 month look forward from the date of of the signing, unless there is prior, other indication that that period should be longer. Um, so I can't. I'm afraid on the technical aspects, I can't answer that. Uh, all I can give you is the general answer as to how how far forward the going concern model should should uh, should work, uh, or what I'm calling the integrated financial model, which is twelve is a rolling twelve months from the date the uh, the forecast date of the signing of the audit. Thank you. If Thank I could, you. that's really helpful. Jill, can I just quickly chip in on that one, actually, if that's okay? So, um, yeah, obviously, um, what Matthew said is is perfectly true. I think what, what we've seen from grant makers is just the challenge around liquidity as much as assets. So we recognise that um, foundations obviously are, are, do have a lot of assets. But when, uh, when the crisis hit in March, our, our focus was very much on how accessible those funds are. So that's where we would focus from a going concern perspective is on how readily can you convert those funds into uh, liquid capital cash to be able to meet your grant making obligations. That, that provides me, by the way, with a sort of a helpful additional Absolutely. aspect to say is that when I talk about a cash flow forecast, I'm talking about an operating and trading cash flow, not an FRS1 statement as in a movement of debtors, creditors, etc. So that's why it's on a 12 month basis, because that actually will reveal liquidity. It's your ability to meet your, your liabilities as and when they fall due, which is a duties question that I'm answering. So that's why I'm talking about this being a management tool and not a compliance tool. Thanks, Matthew. That's that's really helpful. And thanks, Vienna. Yep, that liquidity point is one we've had lots of discussions with um, various foundations with over the last um, 12 months. Um, David's asked me a question. In my experience, is COVID actually tipping charities over the edge? And if so, are we seeing an increase in mergers and collaborations? Really interesting question and one we've been debating quite a lot um, within BDO. We're not actually seeing um, many insolvencies with charities at the moment. We are seeing a lot more collaboration. I think um, COVID has really refocused the strategy. What I would say is I think a lot of charities' financial position has been propped up by the government support at the moment. So a lot of um, chief execs and FDs that I'm talking to um, are definitely concerned, I think, about the next 12 to 18 months as that support falls away and as reserves are depleted. So I think we will continue to see um, more collaboration. I think we will see mergers coming down the, um, on the track. And I think, unfortunately, we will see some insolvencies as well. Um, can I just add into that, Jill? Jill, can I just course. add into that? Just from a, from a broad UK economy perspective, insolvencies are down 34% year on year. That is the biggest ever drop. And that is yeah. just an indication of government support. So, so that again, when it comes back to, to to board responsibilities, there are all sorts of support the government has given given boards and directors. But broadly, first of April is when that starts to get eased, and so that's I, that's where I think we might start to see some changes from that date. Thank you, Matthew. Really helpful. So, hopefully, we've we've managed to answer a number of questions that are coming through. I know a few of them were along a, a similar theme. We are going to collate all of those and we will summarise them and send them through with the slides and the recording early next week. So it just really um, 
comes to me to conclude and to say I hope that's been really helpful. I completely appreciate one that we ran over time, but two, we have given you a huge amount of information. Um, if you would like further information on any of the topics, please do let us know. We'll be sending a feedback form um, round to all of the participants. Uh, we do have, for those that have big retail arms, we do have our charity retail event uh, next week on the 4th of February. Um, so that's targeted at FDs, anyone in the leadership position, and of course the retail teams. You'd be very welcome um, to that. Um, I think towards the end of February, March time, we are, we'll be running another webinar on change programmes and um, successful transformation. So again, maybe of interest. So do watch the website. Um, the mailing list and also our social media posts for times and dates for those. Huge thanks for all of your questions and just have a lovely rest of the day and stay safe. Thanks so much. <laughs>